Chapter 5 of A Confession by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Almer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. But perhaps I have overlooked something, or misunderstood something, I said to myself several times. It cannot be that this condition of despair is natural to man. And I sought for an explanation of these problems in all the branches of knowledge acquired by man. Not from idle curiosity or listlessly, but painfully and persistently, day and night, sought as a perishing man seeks for safety, and I found nothing. I sought in all the sciences, but far from finding what I wanted, became convinced that all who, like myself, had sought knowledge for the meaning of life had found nothing. And not only had they found nothing, but they had plainly acknowledged that the very thing which made me despair, namely the senselessness of all life, is the one indubitable thing that man cannot know. I sought everywhere, and thanks to a life spent in learning, and thanks also to my relations with the scholarly world, I had access to scientists and scholars in all branches of knowledge, and they readily showed me all their knowledge, not only in books but also in conversation, so that I had at my disposal all that science has to say on this question of life. I was long unable to believe that it gives no other reply to life's questions than that which it actually does give. It long seemed to me, when I saw the important and serious air with which science announces its conclusions which have nothing in common with the real questions of human life, that there was something I had not understood. I long was timid before science, and it seemed to me that the lack of conformity between the answers and my questions arose not by the fault of science, but from my own ignorance. But the matter was for me not a game or an amusement, but one of life and death and I was involuntarily brought to the conviction that my questions were the only legitimate ones, forming the basis of all knowledge, and that I with my questions was not to blame, but science if it pretends to reply to those questions. My question, that which at the age of fifty brought me to the verge of suicide, was the simplest of questions, lying in the soul of every man from the foolish child to the wisest elder. It was a question without an answer to which one cannot live, as I had found by experience. It was, what will come of what I am doing today or shall do tomorrow? What will come of my whole life? Differently expressed, the question is, why should I live? Why wish for anything or do anything? It can also be expressed thus, is there any meaning in my life that the inevitable death awaiting me does not destroy? To this one question, variously expressed, I sought an answer in science. And I found that in relation to that question, all human knowledge is divided as it were into two opposite hemispheres, at the end of which there are two poles, the one, the negative, and the other, a positive, but that neither at the one pole nor the other is the answer to life's questions. The one series of sciences seems not to recognize the question, but replies clearly and exactly to its own independent questions. This is a series of experimental sciences. At the extreme end of it stands mathematics. The other series of sciences recognizes the question, but does not answer it. That is the series of abstract sciences. At the extreme end of it stands metaphysics. From early youth I had been interested in the abstract sciences, but later the mathematical and natural sciences attracted me. And until I put my question definitely to myself, until that question itself had grown up within me urgently demanding a decision, I contented myself with those counterfeit answers which science gives. Now in the experimental sphere I said to myself, everything develops and differentiates itself moving towards complexity and perfection, and there are laws directing this movement. You are part of a whole. Having learnt as far as possible the whole, and having learnt the law of evolution, you will understand also your place in the whole, and will know yourself. Ashamed as I am to confess it, there was a time when I seemed satisfied with that. It was just the time when I was myself becoming more complex and was developing. My muscles were growing and strengthening, my memory was being enriched, my capacity to think and understand was increasing. I was growing and developing, and feeling this growth in myself, it was natural for me to think that such was the universal law in which I should find the solution of the question of my life. But a time came when the growth within me ceased. I felt that I was not developing, but fading. My muscles were weakening, my teeth falling out, and I saw that the law not only did not explain anything to me, but that there had never been nor could be such a law and that I had taken for a law what I had found in myself at a certain period in my life. I regarded the definition of that law more strictly, and it became clear to me that there could be no law of endless development. It became clear that to say, in infinite space and time, everything develops, becomes more perfect and more complex, is differentiated, is to say nothing at all. These are words with no meaning, 
For in the infinite there is neither complex nor simple, neither forward nor backward, nor better nor worse. Above all, my personal question, what am I with my desires, remained quite unanswered. And I understood that those sciences are very interesting and attractive, but that they are exact and clear in inverse proportion to their applicability to the question of life. The less their applicability to the question of life, the more exact and clear they are, while the more they try to reply to the question of life, the more obscure and unattractive they become. If one turns to the division of sciences which attempts to reply to the questions of life, to physiology, psychology, biology, sociology, one encounters an appalling poverty of thought, the greatest obscurity, a quite unjustifiable pretension to solve irrelevant questions, and a continual contradiction of each authority by others and even by himself. If one turns to the branches of science which are not concerned with the solution to the questions of life, but which reply to their own specific scientific questions, one is enraptured by the power of man's mind, but one knows in advance that they give no reply to life's questions. Those sciences simply ignore life's questions. They say, to the question of what you are and why you live, we have no reply, and are not occupied with that. But if you want to know the laws of light, of chemical compositions, of the laws of development of organisms, if you want to know the laws of bodies and their form, and the relation of numbers and quantities, if you want to know the laws of your mind, to all of that we have clear, exact, and unquestionable replies. In general, the relation of the experimental sciences to life's question may be expressed thus. Question. Why do I live? Answer. In infinite space, in infinite time, infinitely small particles change their forms in infinite complexity. And when you have understood the laws of these mutations of form, you will understand why you live on Earth. Then in the sphere of abstract science, I said to myself, all humanity lives and develops on the basis of spiritual principles and ideals which guide it. Those ideals are expressed in religions, in sciences, in arts, and in forms of government. Those ideals become more and more elevated, and humanity advances to the highest welfare. I am part of humanity, and therefore my vocation is to forward the recognition and the realization of the ideals of humanity. And at the time of my weak-mindedness, I was satisfied with that. But as soon as the question of life presented itself clearly to me, those theories immediately crumbled away. Not to speak of the unscrupulous obscurity with which those sciences announce conclusions formed on the study of a small part of mankind as general conclusions. Not to speak of the mutual contradictions of different adherents of this view as to what the ideals of humanity are. The strangeness, not to say stupidity, of the theory consists in the fact that in order to reply to the question facing each man, what am I, or why do I live, or what must I do, one must first decide the question, what is the life of the whole, which is to him unknown, and of which he is acquainted with one tiny part in one minute of time. To understand what he is, one man must first understand all this mysterious humanity, consisting of people such as himself, who do not understand one another. I have to confess that there was a time when I believed this. It was the time when I had my own favorite ideals justifying my own caprices, and I was trying to devise a theory which would allow one to consider my caprices as the laws of humanity. But as soon as the question of life arose in my soul in full clearness, that reply at once fell to dust. And I understood that as in the experimental sciences, there are real sciences and semi-sciences which try to give answers to questions beyond their competence. So in this sphere there is a whole series of the most diffuse sciences which try to reply to irrelevant questions. Semi-sciences of that kind, the juridical and social historical, endeavor to solve the questions of man's life by pretending to decide each in its own way, the questions of the life of all humanity. But as in the sphere of man's experimental knowledge, one who sincerely inquires how he is to live cannot be satisfied with the reply, study in endless space the mutations, infinite in time and in complexity, of innumerable atoms, and then you will understand your life. So also a sincere man can't be satisfied with the reply, study the whole life of humanity, which we cannot either know the beginning or the end, or which we shall not even know a small part, and then you will understand your own life. And like the experimental semi-sciences, so these other semi-sciences are the more filled with obscurities, inexactitudes, stupidities, and contradictions the further they diverge from the real problems. The problem of experimental science is the sequence of cause and effect in material phenomena. It is only necessary for experimental science to introduce the question of a final cause for it to become nonsensical. The problem of abstract science is the recognition of the primordial essence of life, 
it is only necessary to introduce the investigation of consequential phenomena, such as the social and historical phenomena, and it also becomes nonsensical. Experimental science only then gives positive knowledge and displays the greatness of the human mind when it does not introduce into its investigations the questions of the ultimate cause. And on the contrary, abstract science is only then science and displays the greatness of the human mind when it can put quite aside the questions relating to the consequential causes of phenomena and regards man solely in relation to the ultimate cause. Such in this realm of science, forming the pole of the sphere, is metaphysics or philosophy. That science states the question clearly, what am I and what is the universe, and why do I exist, and why does the universe exist? And since it has existed, it is always replied in the same way. Whether the philosopher calls the essence of life existing within me, and all that it exists by the name of idea, or substance, or spirit, or will, he says one and the same thing, that this essence exists and that I am of the same essence, but why it is he does not know and does not say. If he is an exact thinker, I ask, why should this essence exist? What results from the fact that it is and will be? And philosophy not merely does not reply, but is itself only asking that question. And if it is real philosophy, all its labor lies in merely trying to put that question clearly. And if it keeps firmly to its task, it cannot reply to that question otherwise than thus. What am I and what is the universe? All in all, nothing. And to the question why, by I don't know. So that however I may turn these replies to philosophy, I can never obtain anything like an answer, and not because, as in the clear experimental sphere, the reply does not relate to my question, but because here, though all the mental work is directed just to my question, there is no answer. But instead of an answer, one gets the same question, only in a complex form. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 of A Confession by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Almer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In my search for answers to life's questions, I experience just what is felt by a man lost in a forest. He reaches a glade, climbs a tree, and clearly sees the limitless distance, but sees that his home is not and cannot be there. And he goes into the dark wood and sees darkness, but there also his home is not. So I wandered in that wood of human knowledge, amid the gleams of mathematical and experimental science which showed me clear horizons but in a direction where there could be no home, and also amid the darkness of abstract sciences, where I was immersed in a deeper gloom the further I went, and where I finally convinced myself that there was and could be no exit. Yielding myself to the bright side of knowledge, I understood that I was only diverting my gaze from the question. However alluringly clear those horizons which opened before me might be, however alluring it might be to immerse oneself in the limitless expanse of those sciences, I also understood that the clearer they were, the less they met my need, and the less they applied to my question. I know, I said to myself, what science so persistently tries to discover, and along that road there is no reply to the question as to the meaning of my life. In the abstract sphere I understood that notwithstanding the fact, or just because of the fact, that the direct aim of science is to reply to my question, there is no reply but that which I myself had been given. What is the meaning of my life? There is none. Or, what will come of my life? Nothing. Or, why does everything exist that exists, and why do I exist? Because it exists. Inquiring for one region of human knowledge, I received an innumerable quantity of exact replies concerning matters about which I had not asked, about the chemical constituents of the stars, about the movements of the sun toward the constellation Hercules, about the origin of species and of man, about the forms of infinitely minute, imponderable particles of ether, but in this sphere of knowledge the only answer to my question, what is the meaning of my life, was, you are what you call your life. You are a transitory, casual cohesion of particles. The mutual interactions and changes of these particles produce in you what you call your life. That cohesion will last some time. Afterwards, the interaction of these particles will cease, and what you call life will cease, and so will all your questions. You are an accidentally united little lump of something. That little lump ferments. The little lump calls that fermenting its life. The lump will disintegrate, and there will be an end to the fermenting, and of all the questions. So answers the clear side of science, and cannot answer otherwise if it strictly follows its principles. From such a reply, one sees that the reply does not answer the question. I want to know the meaning of my life, but that it is a fragment of the infinite, far from giving a meaning, destroys every possible meaning. The obscure compromises which that side of the experimental exact science makes with the abstract science 
when it says that the meaning of life consists in development and cooperation with development, owing to their inexactness and obscurity, cannot be considered as replies. The other side of science, the abstract side, when it holds strictly to its principles replying directly to the question, and in all ages has replied, in one and the same way. The world is something infinite, an incomprehensible part of that incomprehensible all. Again, I exclude all those compromises between abstract and experimental sciences which supply the whole ballast of the semi-sciences called juridical, political, and historical. In those semi-sciences, the conception of development and progress is again wrongly introduced, only with this difference, that there it was the development of everything, while here it is the development of the life of mankind. The error is there as before. Development and progress in infinity can have no aim or direction, and as far as my question is concerned, no answer is given. In truly abstract science, namely in genuine philosophy, not that which Schopenhauer calls professional philosophy, which serves only to classify all existing phenomena in new philosophic categories and to call them by new names, where the philosopher does not lose sight of the essential question, the reply is always one and the same, the reply given by Socrates, Schopenhauer, Solomon, and Buddha. We approach truth only inasmuch as we depart from life, said Socrates when preparing for death. For what do we, who love truth, strive after in life? To free ourselves from the body, and from all evil that is caused by life of the body. If so, then how can we fail to be glad when death comes to us? The wise man seeks death all his life, and therefore death is not terrible to him. And Schopenhauer says, Having recognized the innermost essence of the world as will, and all its phenomena, from the unconscious working of the obscure forces of nature up to the completely conscious action of man, as only the objectivity of the will, we shall in no way avoid the conclusion that together with voluntary renunciation and self-destruction of the will, all those phenomena also disappear. That constant striving and effort without aim or rest on all the stages of objectivity in which and through which the world exists. The diversity of successive forms will disappear, and together with the form all the manifestations of the will, with its most universal forms, space and time, and finally the most fundamental form, subject and object. Without will there is no concept and no world. Before us certainly nothing remains. But what resists this transition into annihilation, our nature, is only the same wish to live, will zum Leben, which forms ourselves as well as our world. That we are so afraid of annihilation, or what is the same thing, that we so wish to live, merely means that we are ourselves nothing but this desire to live and know nothing but it. And so what remains after the complete annihilation of the will, for us who are so full of the will, is of course nothing. But on the other hand, for those in whom the will has turned and renounced itself, this so real world of ours with all its sons and Milky Way is nothing. Vanity of vanities, says Solomon. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What profit hath a man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun? One generation patheth away, and another generation cometh but the earth abideth forever. The thing that hath been is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, See, this is new? It hath been already of old time, which was before us. There is no remembrance of former things, neither shall there be any remembrance of things that are to come with those that shall come after. I, the preacher, was king over Israel and Jerusalem. And I gave my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all that is done under heaven. This sore travail hath God given to the sons of man to be exercised therewith. I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. I communed with my own heart, saying, Lo, I am come to great estate, and have gotten more wisdom than all they that have been before me over Jerusalem. Yea, my heart hath great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I gave my heart to know wisdom, and to know madness and folly. I perceive that this also is vexation of spirit. For in much wisdom is much grief, and he that increaseth knowledge increases sorrow. I said in my heart, Go to now, I will provide thee with mirth, and therefore enjoy pleasure, and behold this also is vanity. I said of laughter, It is mad, and of mirth, what doeth it? I sought in my heart how to cheer my flesh with wine, and while my heart was guided by wisdom, to lay hold on folly, till I might see what it was good for the sons of men that they should do under heaven the number of days of their life. I made me great works, I built me houses, I planted me vineyards, I made me gardens and orchards, and I planted trees in them of all kinds of fruits. I made me pools of water, to water there from the forest where trees were reared. I got me servants and maidens, and had servants born in my house. 
Also I had great possessions of herds and flocks above all that were before me in Jerusalem. I gathered me also silver and gold, and the peculiar treasure from kings and from the provinces. I got me men singer and women singers, and the delights of the sons of men, as musical instruments and all that of all sorts. So I was great, and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. And whatever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy. Then I looked on all the works my hands had wrought, on the labor that I had labored to do, and behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit, and there was no profit from them under the sun. And I turned myself to behold wisdom and madness and folly, but I perceived that one might even happeneth to them all. Then said I in my heart, As it happeneth to the fool, so it happeneth even to me. And why was I then more wise? Then I said in my heart that this is also vanity. For there is no remembrance of the wise more than of the fool forever, seeing that which is in the days to come shall be all forgotten. And how dieth the wise man as the fool? Therefore I hated life, because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me, for all is vanity and vexation of spirit. Yea, I hated all my labor which I had taken under the sun, seeing that I must leave it unto the man that shall be after me. For what hath man of all his labor, and of the vexation of his heart, wherein he hath labored under the sun? For all his days are sorrows, and his travail grief. Yea, even in the night his heart taketh no rest. This is also vanity. Man is not blessed with security that he should eat and drink and cheer his soul from his own labor. All things come alike to all. There is one event to the righteous and to the wicked, to the good and to the evil, to the clean and to the unclean, to him that sacrificeth and him that sacrificeth not. As is the good, so is the sinner, and he that sweareth as he that feareth an oath. This is an evil in all that is done under the sun, that there is one event unto all. Yea, also the heart of the sons of men is full of evil, and madness is in their heart while they live, and after that they go to the dead. For him that is among the living there is hope, for a living dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything, neither have they any more a reward. For the memory of them is forgotten, also their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. So said Solomon, or whoever wrote those words. And this is what the Indian wisdom tells. Sakyamuni, a young happy prince, from whom the existence of sickness, old age, and death had been hidden, went out to drive and saw a terrible old man, toothless and slobbering. The prince, from whom till then old age had been concealed, was amazed, and asked his driver what it was, and how the man had come to such a wretched and disgusting condition. And when he learned that this was the common fate of all men, that the same thing inevitably awaited him, the young prince, he could not continue his drive, but gave orders to go home, that he might consider this fact. So he shut himself up alone and considered it, and he probably devised some consolation for himself, for he subsequently again went out to drive, feeling merry and happy. But this time he saw a sick man. He saw an emaciated, livid, trembling man with dim eyes. The prince, from whom sickness had been concealed, stopped and asked what this was. And when he learnt that this was sickness, to which all men are liable, and that he himself, a healthy and happy prince, might himself fall ill tomorrow, he again was in no mood to enjoy himself, but gave orders to drive home, and again sought some solace, and probably found it, for he drove out a third time for pleasure. But this third time he saw another new sight. He saw men carrying something. What is that? A dead man. What does dead mean? asked the prince. He was told that to become dead means to become like that man. The prince approached the corpse, uncovered it, and looked at it. What will happen to him now? asked the prince. He was told that the corpse would be buried in the ground. Why? Because he will certainly not return to life, and will only produce a stench and worms. And is that the fate of all men? Will the same thing happen to me? Will they bury me? Shall I cause a stench? And be eaten by worms? Yes. Home! I shall not drive out for pleasure, and never will drive again and Sakyamuni could find no consolation in life, and decided that life is the greatest of evils, and he devoted all the strength of his soul to free himself from it, and to free others, and to do so that even after death, life shall not be renewed any more, but be completely destroyed at its very roots. So speaks all the wisdoms of India. These are the direct replies that human wisdom gives when it replies to life's question. The life of the body is an evil and a lie. Therefore, the destruction of the life of the body is a blessing, and we should desire it, says Socrates. Life is that which should not be, an evil, and the passage into nothingness is the only good in life, says Schopenhauer. All that is in the world, folly and wisdom and riches and poverty and mirth and grief, is vanity and emptiness. Man dies and nothing is left of him, and that is stupid, says Solomon. To live in the consciousness of the inevitability of suffering, 
of becoming enfeebled, of old age and of death is impossible. We must free ourselves from life, from all possible life, says Buddha. And what these strong minds said has been said and thought and felt by millions upon millions of people like them, and I had thought and felt it. So my wandering among the sciences, far from freeing me from my despair, only strengthened it. One kind of knowledge did not reply to life's question. The other kind replied directly confirming my despair, indicating not the result at which I had arrived was the fruit of an error or of a diseased state of my mind, but on the contrary that I had thought correctly, and that my mind coincided with the conclusions of the most powerful of human minds. It is no good deceiving oneself. It is all vanity. Happy is he who has not been born. Death is better than life, and one must free oneself from life. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of A Confession by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Alma Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Not finding an explanation in science, I began to seek for it in life, hoping to find it among the people around me. And I began to observe how the people around me, people like myself, lived, and what their attitude was to this question which had brought me to despair. And this is what I found among people who were in the same position as myself as regards education and manner of life. I found that for people in my circle, there are four ways out of the terrible position in which we are all placed. The first was that of ignorance. It consists of not knowing, of not understanding, that life is evil and an absurdity. People of this sort, chiefly women, or very young or very dull people, have not yet understood the question of life which presented itself to Schopenhauer, Solomon, and Buddha. They see neither the dragon that awaits them, nor the mice gnawing at the shrub by which they are hanging. And they lick the drops of honey, but they lick these drops of honey only for a while. Something will turn their attention to the dragon and the mice, and there will be an end to their licking. From them I had nothing to learn. One cannot cease to know what one does know. The second way out is Epicureanism. It consists, while knowing of the hopelessness of life, in making use, meanwhile, of the advantages one has, disregarding the dragon and the mice, and looking the honey in the best way, especially if there is much of it within reach. Solomon expresses this way thus, Then I commanded mirth, because man hath no better thing under the sun than to eat, to drink, and to be merry, and that this should accompany him in his labor the days of his life which God giveth him under the sun. Therefore eat thy bread with joy, and drink thy wine with a merry heart. Live joyfully with the wife whom thou lovest all the days of the life of thy vanity. For this is thy portion in life, and in thy labors which thou takest under the sun. Whatsoever thy hand fitteth to do, do with thy might, for there is not work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whither thou goest. That is the way in which the majority of people of our circle make life possible for themselves. Their circumstances furnish them with more welfare than of hardship, and their moral dullness makes it possible for them to forget that the advantage of their position is accidental, and that not everyone can have a thousand wives and palaces like Solomon, and that for everyone who has a thousand wives there are a thousand without a wife, and that for every palace there are a thousand people who have to build it in the sweat of their brows, and that the accident that has today made me a Solomon may tomorrow make me Solomon's slave. The dullness of these people's imagination enables them to forget the things that gave Buddha no peace, the inevitability of sickness, old age, and death, which today or tomorrow will destroy all these pleasures. So think and feel the majority of people of our day and our manner of life. The fact that some of these people declare the dullness of their thoughts and imaginations to be a philosophy, which they call positive, does not remove them, in my opinion, from the ranks of those who, to avoid seeing the question, lick the honey. I could not imitate these people. Not having their dullness of imagination, I could not artificially produce it in myself. I could not tear my eyes away from the mice and the dragon, as no vital man can after he has once seen them. The third escape is that of strength and energy. It consists in destroying life when one has understood that it is an evil and an absurdity. A few exceptionally strong and consistent people act so. Having understood the stupidity of the joke that has been played on them, and having understood that it is better to be dead than to be alive, and that it is best of all not to exist, they act accordingly and promptly end this stupid joke, since there are means, a rope round one's neck, water and a knife to stick in one's heart, or the trains on a railway. And the number of those in our circle who act this way becomes greater and greater, and for the most part they act so at the best time of their life, when the strength of their mind is in full bloom, and few habits degrading to the mind have as yet been acquired. I saw that this was the worthiest way of escape, and I wished to adopt it. The fourth way out is that of weakness. It consists in seeing the truth of the situation and yet clinging to life, knowing in advance that nothing can come of it. People of this kind know that death is better than life, but not having the strength to act rationally, to 
to end the deception quickly and kill themselves, they seem to wait for something. This is the escape of weakness, for if I know what is best and it is within my power, why not yield to what is best? I found myself in that category. So people of my class evade the terrible contradiction in four ways. Strain my attention as I would, I saw no way except these four. One was not to understand that life is senseless vanity and an evil, and that it is better not to live. I could not help knowing this, and when I once knew that I could not shut my eyes to it, the second way was to use life such as without thinking to the future, and I could not do that. I, like Sakyamuni, could not ride out hunting when I knew that old age, suffering, and death exist. My imagination was too vivid. Nor could I rejoice in the momentary accidents that for an instant threw pleasure to my lot. The third way, having understood that life is evil and stupid, was to end it by killing oneself. I understood that, but somehow still did not kill myself. The fourth way was to live like Solomon and Schopenhauer, knowing that life was a stupid joke played upon us, and yet still go on living, washing oneself, dressing, dining, talking, and even writing books. This was to me repulsive and tormenting, but I remained in that position. I see now that if I did not kill myself, it was due to some dim consciousness of the invalidity of my thoughts. However convincing and indubitable appeared to me the sequence of my thoughts, and of those of the wise that had brought us to the admission of the senselessness of life, there remained in me a vague doubt of the justice of my conclusion. It was like this. I, my reason, have acknowledged that life is senseless. If there is nothing higher than reason, and there is not, nothing can prove that there is, then reason is the creator of life for me. If reason did not exist, there would be for me no life. How could reason deny life when it is the creator of life? Or to put it another way, were there no life, my reason would not exist, and therefore reason is life's son. Life is all. Reason is the fruit, and yet reason rejects life itself. I felt that there was something wrong here. Life is a senseless evil, that is certain, said I to myself. Yet I have lived and am still living, and all mankind lived and lives. How is that? Why does it live when it is possible not to live? Is it that only I and Schopenhauer are wise enough to understand the senselessness and evil of life? The reasoning showing the vanity of life is not difficult, and it has long been familiar to the very simplest of folk, and yet they have lived and still live. How is it that they all live and never think of doubting the reasonableness of life? My knowledge, confirmed by the wisdom of the sages, has shown me that everything on earth, organic and inorganic, is all the most cleverly arranged, only my own position is stupid. And these fools, the enormous masses of people, know nothing about how everything organic and inorganic in the world is arranged. But they live, and it seems to them that their life is very wisely arranged. And it struck me. But what if there is something I do not yet know? Ignorance behaves just in this way. Ignorance always says just what I am saying. When it does not know something, it says that what it does not know is stupid. Indeed, it appears that there is a whole humanity that lived and lives as if understanding the meaning of life. For without understanding it could not live. But I say that all life is senseless and that I cannot live. Nothing prevents our denying life by suicide. Well then kill yourself, and you won't discuss. If life displeases you, kill yourself. You live and cannot understand the meaning of life, then finish it. Do not fool about in life, saying and writing that you do not understand it. You have come into good company where people are contented, and know what they are doing. If you find that dull and repulsive, go away. Indeed, what are we who are convinced of the necessity of suicide, and yet do not commit it? but the weakest, most inconsistent, and to put it plainly, the stupidest of men, fussing about with our own stupidity as a fool fusses about with a painted hussy. For our wisdom, however indubitable it may be, has not given us the knowledge of the meaning of our life. But all mankind who sustain life, millions of them, do not doubt the meaning of life. Indeed, from the most distant time from which I knew anything, when life began, people have lived knowing the argument about the vanity of life, which has shown me its senselessness, and yet they have lived attributing some meaning to it. From the time when any life began among men, they had that meaning of life, and they led that life which descended to me. All that is in me and around me, all, corporeal and incorporeal, is the fruit of their knowledge of life. Those very instruments of thought with which I consider this life and condemn it were all devised not by me, but by them. I myself was born, taught, and brought up thanks to them. They dug out the iron, taught us to cut down the forests, tame the cows and the horses, taught us to sow corn and to live together, organized our life, taught me to think and speak, and I, their product, fed, supplied with drink, taught by them, thinking with their thoughts and words, have argued that they are an absurdity. There is something wrong, said I to myself. I have blundered somewhere. 
but it was a long time before I could find out what that mistake was. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of A Confession by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Almer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. All these doubts, which I am now able to express more or less systematically, I could not have then expressed. I then only felt that however logically inevitable were my conclusions concerning the vanity of life, confirmed as they were by the greatest thinkers, there was something not right about them. Whether it was the reasoning itself, or in the statement of the question, I do not know. I only felt that the conclusion was rationally convincing, but that it was insufficient. All these conclusions could not so convince me as to make me do what followed from my reasoning, that is to say, kill myself. And I should have told an untruth had I, without killing myself, said that reason had brought me to the point that I had reached. Reason worked, but something else was also working, which I can only call a consciousness of life. A force was working which compelled me to turn my attention to this and not to that. And it was this force which extricated me from my desperate situation and turned my mind in quite another direction. This force compelled me to turn my attention to the fact that I and a few hundred similar people are not the whole of mankind, and that I did not yet know the life of mankind. Looking at the narrow circle of my equals, I saw only people who had not understood the question, or who had understood it and drowned it in life's intoxication, or had understood it and ended their lives, or had understood it and yet from weakness were living out their desperate life. And I saw no others. It seemed to me that the narrow circle of rich, learned, and leisured people to which I belonged formed the whole of humanity, and that those millards of others who have lived and are living were cattle of some sort, not real people. Strange, incredibly incomprehensible as it now seems to me that I could, while reasoning about life, overlook the whole life of mankind that surrounded me on all sides, that I could to such a degree blunder so absolutely as to think that my life and Solomon's and Schopenhauer's is the real, normal life, and that the life of the Millards is a circumstance undeserving of attention. Strange as this is now to me, I see that so it was. In the delusion of my pride and of intellect, it seemed to me so indubitable that I and Solomon and Schopenhauer had stated the question so truly and exactly that nothing else was possible. So indubitable did it seem that all those Millards consisted of men who had not yet arrived in apprehension of the, all the profundity of the question, that I sought for the meaning of my life without it once occurring to me to ask, but what meaning is and has been given to their lives by all the millards of common folk who live and have lived in the world. I long lived in this state of lunacy, which, in fact, if it not in words, is particularly characteristic of us very liberal and learned people. But thanks either to the strange physical affection I have for the real laboring people, which compelled me to understand them and to see that they are not so stupid as we suppose, or thanks to the sincerity of my conviction that I could know nothing beyond the fact that the best I could do was to hang myself. At any rate, I instinctively felt that if I wished to live and understand the meaning of life, I must seek this meaning not among those who have lost it and wish to kill themselves, but among those millers of the past and the present who make life and who support the burden of their own lives and of ours also. And I considered the enormous masses of those simple, unlearned, and poor people who have lived and are living, and I saw something quite different. I saw that with rare exceptions, all those millards who have lived and are living do not fit any of my divisions, that I could not class them as not understanding the question, for they themselves state it and reply to it with extraordinary clearness. Nor could I consider them Epicureans, for their life consists of more privations and sufferings than of enjoyments. Still less could I consider them as irrationally dragging on a meaningless existence, for every act of their life, as well as death, is explained by them. To kill themselves they consider the greatest evil. It appeared that all mankind had a knowledge, unacknowledged and despised by me, of the meaning of life. It appeared that reasonable knowledge does not give the meaning of life, but excludes life, while the meaning attributed to life by millards of people, by all humanity, rests on some despised pseudo-knowledge. Rational knowledge, presented by the learned and wise, denies the meaning of life, but the enormous masses of men, the whole of mankind, receive that meaning in irrational knowledge. And that irrational knowledge is faith that very thing which I cannot but reject. It is God, one in three, the creation in six days, the devils and angels, and all the rest that I cannot accept as long as I retain my reason. My position was terrible. I knew that I could find nothing among the path of reasonable knowledge except a denial of life, and there, in faith, was nothing but a denial of reason, which was yet more impossible for me than a denial of life. From rational knowledge it appeared that life is an evil. People know this, and it is in their power to end life, yet they live and still live. And I myself live, though I have long known that life is senseless and an evil. By faith it appears that in order to understand the meaning of life, I must renounce my reason, the very thing for which alone a meaning is required. 
end of chapter 8.